Hey Data Junkies, welcome back. We're starting a brand new topic module here on simple linear regression. I'm excited to have you with us today. This is going to be a somewhat longer module here because regression is a large topic. We've got a lot of ground to cover and this is just going to cover the portions on simple linear regression, one independent variable. We're going to then take it to multiple linear regression in the following modules. So in this particular video series, we're going to be talking about OLS, the Ordinary Least Squares Regression. We're going to talk about, in future videos, how to do things like model fit, conducting it in R, how to incorporate categorical variables, and look at things like regression assumptions and diagnostic tests to see how well our models are doing. So let's go ahead and get started with the basic and fundamentals with regression. Now, I was saying before that I'm really excited to do this primarily because regression is the workhorse of modern quantitative analytics right now. It is used by all sorts of disciplines for all sorts of purposes and reasons. And there are many different types of regression. The one that you're going to be learning in this module series here is called Ordinary Least Squares, or OLS. And from there, it follows into many other types of regression. This is sort of the baseline that most people learn when they take a statistics course. More other types of courses will come in terms of advanced linear models and nonlinear models, and oftentimes you can take an entire course simply on those specific types of regressions. You can check places like uh, quantitative sociology, econometrics, engineering, and a lot of these different schools will offer sorts of advanced courses. Now, when we're talking about ordinary least squares, we're fitting what we call a linear regression, and that's describing it as a straight line, how these dotted points, these observed points that we have, are going to fit onto a straight line. And when we're fitting to the straight line, we're regressing to what we call the mean values of the dependent variable. Now, earlier I said that we're learning simple linear regression, and I also dropped the word multiple linear regression. The distinction between these comes in the number of how many independent variables do you have. Simple linear regression has only one independent variable, whereas multiple linear regression has two or more. And in both cases, we only have one dependent variable. Now, if we were to look at this visually, and we're talking about how this linear regression thing works, you can imagine that you have all of your data points plotted out, and we're going to bisect a line through this. We talked about this briefly in the previous unit with correlations, where the bisecting line through the scatter plot was the best fit line, or the regression line. And when we're talking about that regression line, what we're talking about is the distance from every one of the observed points to that regression line. And the regression line is being fit such that we're minimizing the distances between those. And those distances between the observed point and the line is what we call the residual. And so we're, the overall goal of OLS is to minimize the sums of squared residuals, and that's how we determine the best fit line. Now, let's talk a little bit about the regression formula itself. Back in your early days when you started to learn algebra, you probably came across the formula y equals mx plus b, and that was described to you as what we call the slope-intercept formula. m was the value for slope, and you probably learned it as something like rise over run, where it was some sort of values of x that you would move to the left or to the right, and then some values of y that you would move up or down. Now we're going to morph this same formula here, and in statistics, you might see it as y equals a plus bx, where a is your y-intercept and b is your slope, and x is the same value of x in your observations. Uh, but more traditionally, what we're going to see is y equals b0 plus b plus x, or b1 times, I'm sorry, y equals b0 plus b1 times x. And when we look at this, at the version for y equals b0 plus b1x, we can describe it where b is the value of the y-intercept, or where that regression line is going to cross the y-axis, b1 is going to be the slope of the regression line you have. And when we go into multiple regression, you're going to find that we're going to add additional b's. Each of those will have a different number to distinguish them. And x is your score on your independent variable. Now, let's take a step back for a moment here and look at different regression lines that we could all have out onto a plot. Now, all of these have different regression lines. The one on the most left has the regression line y equals 2 plus 2x. The one in the middle is y equals 2 plus x. And the one on the right is y equals x. Two out of the three will have something in common. The one on the left and the one in the middle share the same y-intercept. They both cross the y-axis at the value positive 2. But they have different slopes. 
So the one on the left has a slope of 2, a b value of 2, where the one on the middle has a slope value of 1. So the one on the left is going to be having a steepness twice that of the one in the middle. Let's compare the one in the middle to the one on the right. The one in the middle has the slope of 1, as does the one on the right. So they both go up and over positive 1 in each case. So these lines are going to be parallel. However, they cross at two different points on the y-axis. The one in the middle crosses at 2, where the one on the right crosses at 0. And we don't see 0 in the regression equation for the one on the right, because it would just simply drop from the equation. We can, we can simplify it to say y equals x, but it could be written as y equals 0 plus x, or y equals x plus 0, and it would mean the same thing. Now, when we want to go ahead and compute b, we want to compute slope, there's a few ways that we can do it manually. And what I have on the screen for you are three different functions on how we can go ahead and compute b. Now, keeping in mind b is being the slope, that's b1, we're not talking about b0, we'll get to that one in just a moment. But all three of these will give you the exact same value. And I put these up here on three different ones, rather than just teaching you one. In case you go out on the internet or look at different books, you may see different versions. And I don't want you to be confused in thinking that you're looking at something different. Now I'm going to provide to you uh, an extra file in class, it's an Excel file, where we're going to take the same data points you're about to see in this analysis here, and it's going to show you that it actually computes the same slope value for each one. Feel free to go ahead and take a look at it. But in future slides here, we're going to take one of these, and we're going to actually prove out for B. Now, I said a moment ago that b was referring to b1 for the slope. b0, we take a slightly different computational approach. Now, if we say that b0 is where we cross the y-axis, it's our y-intercept, then we can assume by knowing that it's going to cross the y-axis that it's also going to cross a line where we have the mean of our, our independent value, or the x, and the mean of the dependent variable, or where it's going to cross for y. So if we know where it's crossing at the two means of our variables, and we already have our slope, then we can go ahead and just put that into a simple equation here, where b0 equals the mean of y minus the slope value we computed times the mean of x, and that'll give us b0. Let's go ahead and put this into an example for practice. So I have five data points and for five observations that are both on x and y. The x values go from 1 to 5, and the y values go 2, 4, 5, 4, 5. The mean of x is 3, the mean of y is 4. I can plot these out, and they're the orange dots you'll see under the graphic there. The green horizontal line is just a straight line cutting across where we have the mean of our y value, and the purple vertical line is the mean of our x value. And so from here we can start to look at, graphically speaking, how we can go ahead and compute b, or our slope. Now when we're looking at the version for x, we'll start here and say, x minus x bar. So we're looking at the distance of each of these plotted points and how far they are from that vertical mean of x. So the distance from 1 to 3 is negative 2, the distance from 2 to 3 is negative 1, and so on. And that will populate into my x minus x bar column. Then I'm going to go ahead and change it up and we're going to flip to seeing how far each of these plotted points are from the y-axis mean. So how far is 1? from the mean of 4, a distance of 2. I'm sorry, the y value of the first point is 2, minus its mean of 4 is negative 2, I misspoke. And then the second point, it, the y value is 4, minus the mean of 4 is 0. The second value at, three, at 5, minus its mean is 1, and so on. Once we have those, we can go ahead and use one of the particular formulas where we can take x minus x bar squared, that's going to be the value that will go into our denominator, and we can take x minus x bar times y minus y bar, and that's going to go up into our numerator. Both the values going up into the numerator and the denominator are going to get summed, and that will end up giving us a value of 6 over 10, which we can simplify to saying 0.6. So our slope, our b1, is going to be 0 0.6, and which means it's going to be uh, not quite as steep as a 1 over 1. It's going to be a little more flat. We're going to move out for every additional one unit of x we increase, we're going to move up 0.6. So let's go ahead and find our b0 from here, our intercept. So we have the mean of y we said was 4, the mean of x we said was 3, and we just computed our slope value of 0 0.6. Plugging that into our intercept equation, we can simplify that out to say 2.2. 
So our regression equation is going to be y equals 2.2 plus 0.6x. So at any given value of x, we can find a value of y because we know the slope, intercept, and we have the slope. Now how do we interpret this particular slope? A moment ago I was talking about in terms of x and y and their changes. So we can say, generically speaking, that a one, it, a one unit change in your x variable corresponds to the slope coefficient's value of an average change in the y value. Now let's go ahead and look at how this might look with most regression-based software. Most regression-based software is going to give you some sort of coefficient value, some estimate for your y-intercept and your independent variable, a standard error associated with those coefficients, a t-score. We want to know if these are going to be statistically significant or not. And the t-scores are calculated by dividing the standard error into the coefficient. And then once you have a t-score, you can approximate out and determine its p-value. So on the screen at the moment, I have using the MT cars data set, which is built into R, and I just did a brief regression of how many miles per gallon can we find based on horsepower. And when we do that, we find that having horsepower has a coefficient of negative 0.068, which means that a one unit change in horsepower corresponds to an average negative 0.068 change in miles per gallon. Or if it sounds a little weird to say negative change, we can drop the negative sign and simply say decrease. So we would change it to say that a one unit change in horsepower corresponds to an average 0.068 decrease in miles per gallon. Now these are one unit changes and I could just as easily do a multiple. So I could say a 100 unit change in horsepower corresponds to an average 6.8 decrease in miles per gallon. So it has a multiplicative effect that we can go ahead and use. And these are both highly statistically significant if we wanted to take that into consideration. Now I could also just rewrite this since I have the coefficient which was listed as the intercept and I have the horsepower so I can rewrite it as a regression equation as miles per gallon equals 30.1 which was rounded minus 0.68 times the horsepower. And with that I get the same interpretations, regardless of if I put it into the regression equation format or as reading it from the table. So let's go ahead and talk a little bit about those uh, p-values I mentioned before. I said it was highly statistically significant, but what does that mean? So each coefficient is going to have its own p-value, and we with those p-values, we can have a null, an alternative hypothesis. The null is going to assume that the coefficient value is zero, and the alternative is going to say anything but zero. So if it has a value of zero, that's going to mean that that slope doesn't have any change on y. So it doesn't matter where it moves on x, it's going to have no change on y. Think back to when we were having the correlations, where a correlation of zero had a no associative effect, that it didn't matter where the x value was, there was no change on y. We're seeing that same determinant here. So let's speak this up and change this up. Sometimes when you see regression equations, you're going to see hats on things. And when you see a hat, that simply means it's predicted value. You may also see an E, or a small epsilon at the end, and that represents what we call the error term. Now, keeping these things into effect, that predicted terms are the values that we have these regression models, and these are the things that we can, our best educated guess. These are going to be the values on the regression line themselves. And the error term is talking about all that different noise, the things that we couldn't put into them. Now, you may see regression equations with and without hats, with and without error terms. So I want you to be able to understand why these are in there. Now, the error terms are always going to be there, regardless if you see them or not. And the hats are simply going to say, is this a predicted value or not? You may also see hats on your Bs to say that these are the predicted coefficients, as opposed to a capital beta, which would be the population coefficient. Now, as I was just saying, that errors are always going to be in your model. They're always going to be there, whether you see the epsilons on there or not. And the errors are our residuals. So that differencing is, if we're talking about y, y is the actual truth, the observed points of things that we know. The regression line is our fitted values, or our y hats. The distance between those y hats to our y's is that amount of error, that is that residual. And as I said before, our entire goal is to minimize the sums of those residuals squared. That is the primary goal of OLS. 
And I'm just going to briefly wrap up here with this little talk on outliers. We're going to talk more about outliers later. But because the regression line is fitting to the mean of all of the different plotted points to get the minimum distances needed here, then every point, including extreme values, are going to be taken into consideration. And the plot I have up here on the screen has a, the black plotted points with a black best fit regression line cutting through there. And that best fit regression line is a little bit down compared to where the rest of the points are, potentially because of a black dot that's out there that could be a possible outlier. And if we were to potentially remove that outlier, we could, in theory, imagine that the regression line might move a bit towards the left to bisect more through those clouds. Now, the red line that I have on the screen there is just sort of a theoretical regression line that I think might possibly appear if that uh, outlier was removed. It might not. It depends on how much draw, how much influence and sway that outlier has on our regression line. And we're definitely going to come back to that uh, much later when we get to regression assumptions and diagnostics. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up this module here. I'll see you all on the next video where we start talking about the regression model itself and determining its fit. I'll see you then.